I've been waiting all day for this. Baron, my handsome man. Hi, human. Hey, babe, you ready? All right, let's roll it. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Soul Sense. I'm so excited this morning because I kind of get to meet one of my longtime girl crushes who uh, I stalk quite vigorously on social media. Um, so this is Jessica, and Jessica uh, runs a company called Alongside Trauma. And I'm just going to give you the floor and let you kind of tell us what it is that you do. Yeah, awesome. So hi, everybody. I'm uh, Jesse. I am a trauma therapist in Kitchener-Waterloo, a little town of Kitchener-Waterloo, Ontario. Um, and I am a trauma therapist. So what that means is that I work with uh, mostly adults, some young adults as well, that come from histories of child abuse, mostly. So I work with um, physical abuse, histories of sexual, emotional um, individuals who might have had parents that struggled with addiction or came from histories of neglect. Um, that's the bulk of the work that I do. A lot of the people that I work with, um, while I do work with some trauma that happens in adulthood, a lot of my clients come from chronic childhood abuse histories. Um, I also am a yoga instructor, although COVID has kind of <laughs> made that a little bit weird. But, um, so I'm also a yoga instructor and uh, predominantly teach trauma-informed uh, cannabis yoga. So um, I look forward to to continuing those classes in in the spring um what else can i say about myself i'm also a writer so i write a lot about trauma reclaiming trauma i talk about sexuality and reclaiming sexuality um yeah kind of dabble in a few things a lot of things i love that kind of um not just a jack of all trades but a master of all of those trades and uh i'll just mention quickly one of the ways that Jesse and I met was through cannabis yoga was actually the piece that kind of brought us together, um, both as yoga instructors wanting to break into what that world was, because we knew that we had felt our own benefits from that. And uh, I feel like that's a whole, you know, other conversation. One of the things that I for sure want to ask you from this moment, and I know that you must be feeling as a, as a therapist at this time, is what has it been like? in COVID versus a non-COVID world mm -hmm. with therapy right now? Because I feel as though, um, you know, cl like, cl like your clientele or people who are dealing with mental health has actually grown exponentially since we've been in COVID. So maybe share with us a little bit about what that, that's been like or what you've noticed happening right now with mental, mental wellness. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a big question, but I think for myself, um, if I were to kind of uh, focus on maybe the biggest pieces that I'm seeing, like one of the biggest areas is people have a lot of time on their own right now. Um, people have a lot of quiet time. People are working from home or not or not working, right? Um, and a lot of people don't don't know how to be alone with themselves, and it can be a really scary thing. Um, and when we are alone with ourselves. And many of us have learned to kind of bottle or suppress some of the shit that happened to us. Um, unfortunately, that only works so long and busyness and productivity is a great cover for a lot of that. Mm. But what happens when our access to productivity and busyness is taken away, right? All of that starts to come up again. So I work with a lot of people who are um, kind of in this place of, well, I guess now is the time to start working on that childhood stuff. <laughs> so there's that piece. And that piece itself isn't really different for me because that is the basis of my work. But what I would say is I've shockingly, um, I've had a lot of new clients join my roster, I think because of the fact that 
a lot of people are having this resurfacing of trauma. Um, the other area that I would say that I'm really seeing a lot of is high levels of depression and isolation and not, um, and people just not knowing how to navigate the feeling of loneliness, right? Um, so that is also that something that I've been trying to help people navigate. One of the last things that I would say too is, you know, I think a lot of people think that when you're a therapist or when you have a background in, in, you know, therapy and things like that, that you have a lot of answers or you have like magic solutions to things. And I've become really comfortable being, being a fellow human that is also living through this pandemic and, and struggling at times with it. Um, I've become more comfortable as a therapist to not have the answers, to simply just sit with another human and say, yeah, this sucks. And yeah, it makes sense that you're feeling lonely. And maybe we can use this hour to just connect human to human, even though I can't provide any solutions. I, I, I see you. I know that this is really hard, right? Um, so that was a little bit of a learning curve for me because I tend to be a little bit more solution focused and COVID has really forced me to reevaluate that. Right. And I think we always, from the therapist perspective, you always want to have the, the thing to give them, right? But there's not always, there isn't a, a magic answer. And one of the things that I think, uh, you know, people need to also realize on the side of the patient is that there's a lot of work we have to do for ourselves. Like it's one thing to sit with you, but you, you're right. You can't wave that magic wand. And, and there's always a lot of like internal work that we have to do with ourselves. Um, and, and with kind of the depression and isolation and, and that type of thing, do you notice, and, and I ask because when we're when we're isolated that way, we tend to go to things that aren't super beneficial for us or self-harm if we're not moving in the direction of, you know, maybe we're working out every day, we're trying to land on a yoga mat, we're trying to be mindful of what we're doing. Have you noticed an increase in people turning to different substances or turning to things that way as, as a way to cope, being that they are alone or doing that thing? Is, is that a piece that you've noticed or is that something you've noticed on the decrease? I definitely not decrease for sure. I would say, um, so a lot of the clients that I work with, I don't work with, um, I don't work with a lot of individuals that, uh, uh, currently struggle with addiction, but actually I do have a couple of clients who, um, are like have histories of addiction who have started to work with me, who have started to work with me to, as a way for them to avoid relapse, right? So as a part of their safety plan, they're like, I know that I'm feeling very isolated. I'm feeling very lonely. So I think that having a therapist right now would be really beneficial as a part of my relapse prevention. Right. So that's one piece that I've noticed. Um, I do work with a lot of individuals who use cannabis. And I think that a piece of that is just because of how I promote myself on my business and kind of some of my beliefs. And what I always say to people, even about cannabis use, is anything can become an unhealthy coping mechanism. Right. So if we aren't, and I myself as a daily cannabis user, there have been times where I have needed to take tolerance breaks during COVID because I was using way more than what I was used to. And I really went through these phases of reevaluating why do I use cannabis? Because I've forgotten. Right. And so taking it out completely and reminding myself, oh, right, I use it for anxiety. I use it for sleep. I don't need to use it when I'm watching a movie all day. Right. So it's, I think that some of that has been reshaping that for clients of what is your cannabis use like right now? Um, some of my clients, through doing the trauma work in general, right? Like, because a big part of trauma work is, reconnecting to all that is this, um, notice for themselves, I notice that I'm scrolling on my phone mindlessly, which scro phone scrolling is of itself also an, a, a form of addiction because of all the dopamine and all of this, all of that stuff. So I have clients who through their trauma work have been more able to be more mindful of what coping mechanisms that they're using that are becoming problematic. Um, and then we reevaluate it in, in, in therapy. 
I think that uh, you, you couldn't have hit the nail more on the head in that cannabis, although we see it, and I think this is where it becomes kind of a little bit of a blurred line. Yes is now, and now is recognized, you know, as the medicine that it is and for all these, these yeah. reasons. But uh, for the same reason as you, I actually, you know, from someone who's a huge advocate for cannabis, um, I took the month off of November because I needed to, again, was consuming daily, maybe more than I needed to. It's yeah. COVID. I'm still being a productive person throwing all my things out, but who am I if I step away from it? And why is it that I was turning to it yes. so often besides just justifying it as like, well, I'm not a lazy cannabis user and I'm a yes. super productive person. Yeah. So it, does it really matter if I'm smoking it all day long? And, yeah. and let me tell you, taking a month off, um, the first week was hella ugly. It was yeah. it, because it was this big, like, now you're going to lay in bed for a little bit and you're going to actually have to figure out what's going on. Totally. Right. Or that anxiety that you have, you have to figure out how to self-regulate because yeah. maybe you will be in a position where you're not always going to have it available to you. And do you have the other tools that you need to be able to combat those things without it? And you know, by week two, it was a little more comfortable. By week three, it was good. And then by week four, it was like, now I recognize why I turn to it, where I need it, where I'm using yeah. it for anxiety, for sleep, very much similar to you, where I'm using it for recreation. Yeah. Um, and I do, I ask my clients that too, as well at times when they're also cannabis users is just check yourself when yeah. you're using it, yes. because we do use it as a crutch and it can be one of those superpowers that we use for good and evil. Yeah, like, I really appreciate that um, that you do that as well. And I think that that's a really great thing. It's, it's a tool like anything else, but it shouldn't be a crutch. Well, yeah. and one of the things that I do, because I tend to have a, a holistic approach to things and try to always come at it through the lens of harm reduction, not placing shame or judgment, right? And what I always say to the people that I work with is, I will never um, say whether or not, you know, you're doing something wrong or you're coping in the wrong way. If you come to me with something, one of the things that I'm going to ask is, okay, so this is your coping mechanism, whether it be weed or your phone scrolling or whatever it is, what is the impact on other areas of your life? So is it impacting your friendships? Is it impacting your relationship? Is it impacting you financially, right? I think all of that also plays into how we evaluate what we're doing to cope, right? Um, so yeah, that's another little piece there. I love that. Now, I, I have a question for you as a practitioner. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's interesting because I'm, I, I'm in school right now for mental wellness and addiction. And right. um, one of the things that we're, we're always focusing on, and one of the things that I feel right now, even as a student, um, is that our practitioners are getting very fatigued also because mm -hmm. there's such a high demand um, for supports right now for people dealing yeah. with mental wellness and things going on because of COVID. And like you said, there's a bit of an increase in what that is. So for you as a yeah. practitioner, as the person who holds space for everybody else, what do you do in your life for your self-care? And do you notice yeah. that it's almost like people turn, they see practitioners, therapists, psychotherapists, you know, counselors, psychologists, all of these different things as maybe not quite human. And like, we can yeah. come in and load all our stuff on you and you'll be fine because you're not going through COVID, right? Or you're not yeah, doing yeah. that. So like, what do you do um, for yourself right now in this while you hold space for everybody else? Oh, yeah, it, yeah. Ooh. So what I would say is I, I'm a big writer, so I write a lot. Um, I write on a bunch of different kind of platforms. I have a Patreon and I write anonymously on Reddit about kink and reclaiming sexuality and things like that. I write on my blog. So as a writer, I process a lot of my own emotions through publishing my writing and having people relate to it. So there's that. Um, a big piece, I think, of my own COVID coping is one of my partners had said to me, um, you're really good with being creative in the boundaries of COVID, like within the rules of how to keep things safe and things like that. You're very creative and adaptable. And this is something that I think, you know, one of the clients that I work with mentioned that 
we were talking about some of the ways in which our trauma teaches us things, even though that comes from a shitty place, right? Mm -hmm. But we come out of it with these adaptive skills. And she labeled it as my trauma superpowers. And I think that that is really relevant in these times because I am super adaptable. And so if you give me a box, I'll be like, okay, what can I do within that box? Like how creative can I get? Right. So, yeah. you know, I'll do, um, you know, outdoor visits with friends where like we keep our distance, but like from the very beginning, even before, you know, outdoor visits were a thing, I was like, oh, so being outdoors is okay. This is a way that I can cope. Um, doing like games online with friends. So, you know, I, I definitely, I will admit struggle with Instagram. I will scroll on Instagram. It's, it's, it's my, one of my unhealthy coping mechanisms. So what I tried to do was I was like, okay, I need socialization. I am an extrovert. I need people. So what I tried to do instead was rather than shame myself about how much I was on my phone, well, what am I on my phone doing? Right? So for example, I started joining like kick chat rooms to like talk with different people. I started exploring Reddit during COVID and discovered community on Reddit. I, um, you know, message friends a lot to try and just keep up my messaging. One of the other things that I do is I will try to do face, uh, like FaceTime or phone calls instead of messaging and texting to keep up social skills, to keep up communication with other humans where I can see their body language, et cetera, um, getting outdoors. And one of the big things too is just like I mentioned earlier, like being honest with clients when I myself am struggling, right? Like when I go through phases of winter's coming and I also struggle with SAD and, and things like that. Right. So, um, yeah, a lot of the coping mechanisms that I share with clients are often coping mechanisms that I myself implement. Um, and I guess one of the last really big things is I think I'm very lucky that, you know, I went to school and learned about trauma and really began to understand my body as a whole because I'm better able now to really notice when I am super dysregulated. Like when my body is not okay, I'm able to zone into it a little bit earlier than in the past when things might have gone full spiral. I can notice the early signs of me becoming dysregulated now and put coping mechanisms in place to to boost me up a little bit before, you know, things go chaotic. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of what I'm doing. I love that. And, and your, your self-awareness, I think is really big. And I think that that's, it, it's like anything. And I always break it down as something, you know, learning a new behavior or changing anything is as simple, yeah. as simple as trying to change our posture. First, we have to recognize we're doing it improperly. Yeah. We have to catch that behavior before we can start to change it. Um, so I really love that. And I'm not sure if you're very much like me in the sense that one of the reasons I got into personal training and yoga and, and you know, mental wellness and addiction and all of the pieces mm -hmm. throughout the last decade of my life is actually to keep myself on track because it's, you know, it's really hard to offer those things to other people when we don't put them into practice ourselves and we have to really force ourselves to do that. Yeah. Um, so so I, I love and appreciate that you recognize that about yourself. And and before we kind of break off and please, you know, Jesse and I are going to have a few more conversations <laughs> some other ways in which I need to kind of scratch into her brain and, and ways of things. But before we sign off today, what are some of the things what is some advice or the best piece of advice you can give to people who have not only been struggling through COVID, but maybe now we're looking down, you know, the barrel of what may be another year, but, but we're heading into winter. And so I think in a lot of ways, if we thought that what was happening was really difficult over the spring and summer and fall when we had access to nature and to different yeah. areas, what is some of the best advice you would give to anyone, whether they're struggling on a minimal level or, you know, really intensely with any form of mental wellness in COVID going into this next season? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. So one of the things that I actually shared with one of my clients yesterday is 
looking back at what what brought you moments of happiness now the concept of happiness we could have a whole other discussion about so i use the language of moments of happiness um what are areas that you found moments of happiness throughout the summer or throughout the fall so for example this one client was like well i loved being outside and gardening right so and this is my adaptable brain how can you take the activity of gardening in the summer, which brought you a moment of happiness and alter it so that it is winter, uh, winter, I don't know, like uh, accommodated, right? So I brought up the idea of what if you created an indoor garden? What if you went to a nursery and grabbed plants that can live indoors and you're still surrounded by life because there's science that shows that being around pets and living things impacts our nervous systems positively right so that's one uh one way i reframe things the other thing is uh we are social beings so we are social animals yes there are rules and regulations and lockdowns happening that may prevent us from physically connecting with one another I still am an advocate for social distanced visits, even if you're going outside on a hike. Um, you know, like when I go out on hikes with friends, we I wear a mask, I just be safe, right? Um, I still find value in even if it's cold out, get outside for even 30 minutes, get outdoors. If you can have a friend join you, great. Animals, amazing. Again, animals provide a real Are just one of the reasons that I'm so drawn to you and I just want to take a moment um, in admiration for you is that you speak so freely about the things that you've moved through and the pieces that you've experienced and I love the way that you're normalizing um, or taking that step forward in normalizing things that people may feel shame or misunderstanding about and and so I I would like to thank you for, for showing up and holding the space that you hold, not only for me, but for everyone else. And, and I don't know if you realize to the extent in which you do it, but you do. And it's, it's really beautiful um, that you take that step out and that you're vulnerable in that way. It's just so wonderful to, to, to have people <laughs> like you. No, it's just, I don't know if anyone said that to you recently, but like, I just, I admire you so much for doing that because in your vulnerability, you show so much power and strength in just what you're doing and so much truth to that and and it brings a sense of calm to people like i i know how your clients must feel when they land with you because i felt that way landing with you today and so i just thank you so much for for not only taking time to chat with me but continuing to share yourself with the world and with people um just please don't stop doing that we need more of that out there so so thank you for being being you I can, yeah, I can. <laughs> but I'm glad you could hear me. I'm glad you could hear me. And and we'll just we'll just tie it up with a no audio sound and just let like like thank you so much. Um, we'll 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 be back to chat more for sure.